Yeah. Uh, gentlemen, I think we are on, on the air now, and uh, the yeah. list for attendees is building up, and I think they are very much interested in football as much as they are interested in pediatric <laughs> surgery. Yeah, that's why we can continue, right? <laughs> eh? Yeah, they, they would like you to, to continue on that uh, line. But uh, we have received a very good number of registrations, reaching up to 400 registrations, and the list is building up right in front of me right now. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome you all from different parts of the world. I wouldn't say good morning or good afternoon, because 50% of the time I'll be mistaken. So I'll, I'll say greetings and welcome to everyone from different corners of the world to join our WUFAPS online meetings in a series of distinguished speakers with distinguished sessions about very important topics in pediatric surgery. Today we have uh, two big names in the field of pediatric surgery, actually two stars in the sky of pediatric surgery, Dr. Uh, Amolia Saxena and Dr. Martin Lacher. If I uh, detail their CV, they will consume all time, so I'll leave it to Juan, who will briefly introduce them. They'll be talking about two very important and common topics in pediatric surgery, that is minimally invasive management of duodenal atresia and diaphragmatic hernia. We have, again, two eminent moderators for this session. That's uh, Juan uh, D'Agostin and Udo Roli, very well known uh, in the field of pediatric surgery. And this promise actually a very hot discussion. What we need from you, the audience, is your interactivity as usual. Keep posting your interesting comments and questions in the chat box. And I'd like to highlight that this uh, activity is sponsored by Alexandria Medical Training Center, the IT part and the uh, transmission. So thank you again and welcome to our uh, online WUFAPS webinar. And Juan, it's all yours now. Hello, everybody. Uh, I think it's really a honor to be here uh, today uh, to, to join with all of you. And especially, uh, I, I want to express my gratitude to be invited by uh, Professor Samir Sahata, you know, president of the WUFAPS, and also to Alexandria Medical Training Center. I think it's an opportunity uh, to share uh, many interesting things that we are going to see right now. Um, well, this is a, a meeting that is, uh, thanks to WOFAPS and the European Pediatric Surgical Association, uh, it's going to be heard to, uh, today. Um, we have two main speakers. Uh, Professor Martin Lacher is uh, the head of the Department of Pediatric Surgery in, at the University of Leipzig in Germany. He's also the chairman of the UPSA Education Office. Uh, he has a, a lot of experience in diaphragmatic hernia, as he was uh, a very important part of a team that deal uh, with a lot of mm, patients with diaphragmatic hernia in Germany, in a, working in a reference center. So I'm sure he was going to show us uh, many interesting points about that. Uh, I would like to, uh, to remember that uh, CD8 is a, a very interesting topic in pediatric surgery. I want to show you here a, a graphic in the left that is uh, the surgeon at PubMed. The number of articles published from 2000 to 2021 is more than 300 papers every year is publishing in the last uh, five years. But in uh, relating to thoracoscopy in CD8 is quite a few. You can see uh, on the right side uh, a figure with the small number of uh, publications about this topic. So I think that this is a, a nice opportunity to hear to Professor Martin Lacher uh, about this topic. Then, uh, Professor Amulia Saxena uh, is also a very well-known pediatric surgeon all over the world. He uh, is the president-elect of the UPSA, and he works uh, at the Chelsea Children's Hospital in uh, uh, London, UK. Uh, 
Uh, he has a lot of experience in congenital malformations uh, and surgery. And he is going to talk about duodenal atresia. Uh, I also uh, was uh, um, finding out uh, at the PubMed the number of publications. And you can see here that the congenital uh, duodenal atresia uh, it has a low number of publications. So it's a good topic to uh, uh, do more research on, on this. And even there is quite a few papers in laparoscopy, uh, starting the first paper, the very first paper in 2000. So I think uh, today uh, we have a great opportunity to listen uh, to uh, big professors uh, talking about these two topics. And I have uh, uh, my pleasure to commiserate with Professor Rudolf Roll, um, uh, that uh, he's a very well, very well known uh, pediatric surgeon. So, Professor Martin Lacher, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Juan. Thank you, Same and uh, Udo, for the for the opportunity to be part of this webinar, a combined Vofab Supsa webinar, which uh, brings our societies a little together. And uh, to talk about one of my favorite um, uh, topics, minimal invasive surgery in the newborn. And um, yeah, I'm, um, I will start now. Um, 150 babies are born each day worldwide with congenital diaphragmatic hernia. This is every 10 minutes. And every 30 minutes, a CDH newborn dies. And the incidence, and a lot of people don't know, is actually as frequent as cystic fibrosis, for example. And the uh, mortality of uh, CDH is up to 50%, and the morbidity is almost every patient. Treatment, as you all know, is intensive care and surgery. Those are the two defects. Um, the main defects, the posterior defect, named the Bokdalek hernia after a Czech anatomist, and then the Margagni hernia in the anterior defect. Um, I will briefly talk about that in the end. Um, the beginnings, the first big series derived from Boston, Robert Gross in 1946, described in his famous textbook here, the open repair of a CDH. And what is interesting at that time, they were operating very early. So Robert Gross said they should be operated as soon as the diagnosis is made in the first 48 hours. In hindsight today, we know this was the honeymoon per period, but they thought later on they were getting unstable. And what is also interesting reading that book of Robert Gross is how they uh, performed the surgery. So they put a hemostat on the phrenic nerve, crushed the phrenic nerve, and put the diaphragm at rest because they thought if the diaphragm was not moving up and down, it was easier to repair the defect. And by doing that, the uh, phrenic nerve recovers actually in the next five to six weeks. I thought that was interesting. We're not doing this anymore. Surgical options for an open repair are the incisions. Here, I prefer, if I have to do it, the blue line giving the rectus muscle, leaving the rectus muscle intact, which I think is uh, important for breathing and <clears throat> also cosmetically, this is better. The next step was 1995, David Van der Zee describing the laparoscopic repair of a diaphragmatic hernia, not in a neonate, but in a six month old child. And um, he thought that this had several advantages, including easy reposition of the intestines in the abdomen and um, closure of the defect which was easier from the abdominal side compared to the thorax. And then this is the topic I'm gonna to talk about to today. 20 years ago, Francois Beckmer from Strasbourg actually developed um, or first described the thoracoscopic repair of a CDH. He's a very nice guy. I first met him two years ago on an MIS workshop in Naples, and he's a great speaker also, especially on that topic. So these are the main aspects I'm gonna talk about today. It's the technique of CDH repair thoracoscopic and the controversies coming with it, which is also for the later discussion. Starts as always with positioning of the 
patient on the table, which can be on the edge in a particular uh, way or at the end of the table. This is how we do it in Leipzig at the end of the table and the monitor is in line between the surgeon and the defect. When you drape the patient, it's, it's important to leave the mamilla free. I hope you can see this video, maybe not as smoothly as I see it, but I hope it's okay. And for orientation, leave the mamilla free. And to do that in a safe way, you have to teamwork. And an important part of the teamwork is anesthesia. So you see here, we're performing thoracoscopy and on the left side, you see the anesthesiologist and she has access to the patient as, at all times. And this is really key to work together with your anesthesiologist if you do neonatal thoracoscopy. Proper preparation is also important for every operation in Leipzig, we have a standardized way to, to set everything up, the scrub nurse, what to prepare. We know how to position the patient, what we need to position the patient. Um, and the anesthesiologist know how that works and what he or she needs. I think that's really important because in neonatal laparoscopy, there are a lot of factors and a lot of tiny little things. And if some tiny little thing goes wrong, that can make the entire procedure miserable. If the positioning is not good, if your trockers are placed the wrong way, or if your instrument are not really good, then or your knots are not good, then you really are into trouble. So it is a, it's a chain of little things. This is how I, um, I position my trockers. The camera chokers here show in blue, um, make sure not to place that too close to the scapula because otherwise you get problems angling your uh, light, um, uh, your uh, scope. This is um, uh, the, the chokers, how we put it. And always keep in mind, there's the head under there, uh, not to lean on the patient's head. Another way of choker placement is this here. I've done this in the past to put the camera choker in the axilla. That gives you the beauty that the corner is a little easier to sew. You see here in the dashed line in the cartoon, the defect is actually in that corner and from the angulation, that's a little easier. Whatever you prefer, both ways are possible. What is important though, don't be afraid to put out another choker or an, another metal probe if you need that. Instruments three millimeters, of course, and then a camera three or five, however you like it. First step is the reduction of the viscera. Start with very low pressures and low flow and use blunt graspers. Um, this is a, a little video you see in the right upper corner. There is a patient with a lot of bowel loops and air in the thorax, so it's not so super easy. And in those cases, even with starting low pressures, just be very calm and wait and wait and do slow movements and give the, the bowel time to be reduced in the abdomen. The spleen should go um, last. You can see here, um, it's a little further in that same patient. And in the end, you see there is medially a little diaphragm left, which is good. So the defect is on the lateral side. And then in the end, you have the spleen. You can take a little swab, put it inside and then push on the spleen, or you can actually take the hilum of the spleen and push inside the abdomen or push very gently with an open blunt grasper. That's up to you. After that, you have the spleen as a cap, as you can see in the right upper quadrant here, um, uh, that cap prevents the bowels from popping out. You can Cauterize the diaphragmatic edges will give you a more raw surface, um, which may stick the diaphragm and edges better together. There's no evidence that this prevents recurrence, but it's, I think, a reasonable thing to do. Well, you can have the spleen as a cap, but the bulk can still pop out, and that's not so infrequent. So what do you do then? In the bowel is always popping out, you can take a first stitch at 12 o'clock outside in, then take the posterior part of the diaphragm and then stitch out again. And then you get an inverted V kind of uh, funnel 
where you can um, then advance your stitches and that keeps the bowel loops on the abdominal side. Well, you see that here, the, the skin is still out and now you very gently push the skin in, make sure it's not bleeding. You see there is another metal probe because the bowel was all pushing out all the time. And this is the 12 o'clock stitch. It goes outside in. And then you take the rear edge there just as a kind of hitch stitch to create that funnel where you can sort of um, keep the bowel loops on the abdominal side. What is important to know how to do knots? And the sliding knot is really a key thing that you need to practice in the box, box trainer. Place enough stitches and do not leave gaps between the stitches. That's really key. And that's the same patient. I will use Athibond 2.0 or Silk is also nice. And in this patient where it's quite challenging, um, you, you sort of advance the stitches from medial to lateral, make sure, of course, not to stitch the bowel, but that's usually not a, not a problem. Also make sure you're not squeezing the diaphragmatic lip too much that you injure it because if you tear it, that's really difficult. And then you see that first hitch stitch really helps you to keep the bowel in. And then you place your knots and then you go from medial to lateral. The corner stitch is always the challenge. It's difficult to sew and tie in this very small space. So you see in the left, left upper quadrant, the, the, the rib. And what you do is actually pericostal sutures around the rib to close the lateral defect. And you tie it actually from the outside over the rib, as you can see here. There's actually a paper on it from the Patkovsky group in, uh, in Rotslav. Um, and well, I saw, sorry, it's the Krakow group. And they actually have this pierce technique of closing um, inguinal her hernias and they use the same needles to do this pericostal sutures is very nice paper describing the te technique. And I'm gonna show you now here. So this is an older patient, three months old, which is the ideal case to start if you don't want to do thoracoscopic CDH. It's not the neonate, which is hemodynamically unstable, pulmonary hypertension, all this. So this is the ideal patient. Lung is still a little hypoplastic and not in the way. And you see the reposition of the bowel loops is very easy and there's nothing popping out. And then this is the uh, sliding knot I showed you, uh, which brings the edges which are under tension very nicely together. And here's this pericostal stitch. So the ethibond went from outside in, you see, and then now I advanced on the other side of the rib a needle. And over that needle, I introduced a proline loop. And the ethibond suture goes through that proline loop, which now catches the ethibond suture and pulls it out again. And then you come out through the same hole in the skin and then you tie it down and then the edge is closed. Small defects are very easy to close with interrupted stitches, as, as you can see here. What is a challenge is the big defects. If you have a case like this, this is really hard to do thoracoscopically and maybe it's also not a good idea. However, in these maybe type C defects, you sometimes can try. And then one option is that you close medially with interrupted stitches and only the lateral remaining defect you patch with a little patch. I use Gore-Tex. I know there are other materials on the market also. How do you get the patch in the thorax? You cannot push it inside because it will stick, get trapped in the thor thoracic wall, but you go in here uh, inside out and grab it and then pull it in. And you see it's still hard to get this one millimeter Gore-Tex patch with two graspers in the thorax, but finally you succeed. Now, is the thoracoscopic approach better than the open? Well, first of all, it's a question whether you are an open surgeon or you are also a laparoscopic surgeon, but it's not as simple as this. 
there are advantages and disadvantages. And these controversies I would like to discuss now. Um, we had a publication last year in the European Journal discussing these controversies in what is state of the art. And Richard Wagner, who's now from my group, who's now in, working in Boston in a lab right, right now, we did a video journal club also, which you can see on Facebook on this topic. The first question is, why should you do thoracoscopic repairs? Well, I think ventilation times are shorter. Post-operative pain is less. The, the view is great and the exposure is great. Cosmesis is very nice also because you avoid a laparotomy. However, there are downside also, and one downside is recurrence. I did a survey within the IPEC group uh, six years ago, and uh, we asked a lot of questions, and among them, the question, do you believe CDH can be repaired equally by open procedures and thoracoscopic procedures? And only 50% of the IPEC group answered this with yes. So everybody had experienced some recurrences with thoracoscopy. And in the same study, we assessed the contraindication that people thought would be. And this is patient on ECMO, preoperative need for ECMO, right to left shunting, uh, small babies, liver, in, liver up, and right-sided defect. There is recurrence associated with the following four items, large defects, need for ECMO, PET repair, or liver herniation. And there are actually, in the last 10 years, three papers that I want to discuss now with you addressing those recurrence. So there's the CDH, uh, International CDH Study Group, over 4,000 patients, and they calculated that the thoracoscopic repair is, has an odds ratio of 3.6 increase recurrence after MIS repair. There's um, this uh, systemic review and meta analysis of eight observational studies with these numbers, and they found that MIS, both laparoscopy and thoracoscopy, were associated with a significantly higher recurrence rate. Of note, one of the meta analysis showed that the recurrence is only increased in patients where you sew in a patch thoracoscopically, but not the direct closure. Let's talk about hypercapnia because this was a widely discussed topic. You may know this study from the Great Ormond Street eight years ago. They had randomized controlled trial, including very few numbers, but 10 CDH patients also. And they observed significant hypercapnia and acidosis. However, in this study, they started with pressures of seven and eight, which is very high and too high. However, their conclusion was at that time to stop thoracoscopic CDH repair. At the same time, however, there were other studies showing that the CO2 levels are no problem using thoracoscopy and laparoscopy. So how can that be? Well, there are uh, methods to avoid hypercapnia and acidosis, and these are listed here. Work very close with your anesthesiologist. If you have a CO2 of 70 or 80, that's not out of a sudden. That, that is slowly increasing, and you have to catch it early. The CO2 actually helps to reduce the bowel in the abdomen, but once the, the bowel loops are in, um, you can come off CO2. You can stop the insufflation. Uh, because the lungless hypoplastic is never in, in, the, in the way in contrast to uh, esophageal atresia, for, for example. And um, if you use before that coming off CO2 very low pressures and the spleen as a cap, you will not have hypercapnia and acidosis. Also check the CO2 levels every 30 minutes and then you're on the safe side. Let's talk about patch repair. There are two um, high volume centers that published this study five years ago, and they su suggested from the Netherlands and Germany uh, to use dome shaped patches um, to decrease the tension on the diaphragm and patch. And um, also patch, and that's another study from the Netherlands 
that's one of the referral centers here in Europe, that if you use a patch very deliberate, that reduces your tension and recurrence too. Let's summarize the evidence about the pros and cons of thoracoscopic CDH repair. Looking at the four meter analysis which we have, in green are the benefits, shorter length of stay and shorter time to full feeds was shown in one meter analysis. That it has less complications was never shown. Less mortality was shown in three out of four meter analysis. However, you can imagine that the more stable patients will maybe have undergone thoracoscopy more likely than the, the ones which are unstable. That's why there is a bias there. The downside is longer operation time and a higher recurrence rate, which was shown in all the four meter analysis. So, what is the solution? Augusto Zani and uh, Luis uh, Montalva uh, wrote a very nice chapter in, in our book um, that was published last year. And they first show that the recurrence rate is decreasing over time. And there's maybe a learning curve of the surgeon, but there, the patient selection is key. So look at the, the size of the defect, defect size A and B. In the lower line, you see the recurrence rate is not very high. However, if you want to repair thoracoscopy um, type C and D defects, so big, large defect, then your recurrence rate goes up. So patient selection may be the key. Summarize the um, evidence which is out there. So regarding recurrence rate, CDH study group showed an increased recurrence okay. after MIS. One meter analysis showed only increase recurrence if a patch is used. Hypercapnia, the randomized trial grade almond three showed is a problem. However, if you, um, if you do certain methods to avoid it, it's not a pro problem anymore. Patch repair, if you do it, dome shaped patches and deliberately use patches. Let's talk about diaphragmatic eventration just with a few slides here on the right side. You all know it's controversial when to operate and which patients to operate. However, the lungs, they grow until the children are 10 years old. So I think it's reasonable to give the lungs space also because the thoracoscopy really has excellent results in um, plicating the diaphragm. I wanna show you two techniques how to do this. This is a right-sided um, eventration, and we introduce a, a tui needle from the right side to the left side and sort of shish kebab all the folds of the diaphragm in, and then use a, a knot pusher from the left side, do that again. And that gives you actually a very nice raffi of the diaphragm also with a knot pusher. And then this is the slide knot again, with an Ethibon zero suture here, you can actually do the rest of the plication with uh, multiple stitches. And that's actually a pretty straightforward procedure that in the end you have a nice raffi. And this was the result after the surgery. So it's a, you, if you use that TUI needle and the external knot pusher, you even don't have to sew in the chest, which may be a challenge for some people. Briefly on Morgagni hernia, after the Italian anatomist. It's a different concept. It's not from the thorax, it's from the abdomen. This is how the uh, patient is um, positioned. This is the view you see in the left upper quad quadrant, the, the, the bowel in the chest. And how you suture that, I will show you in this short video. First of course, uh, reposition of the bowel loops. And then you want to create raw edges, and that's why I use the uh, monopolar hook to buzz my uh, grasper. And then it's a stitch from outside in directly through the lip also, and then inside out through the same hole. You sort of backhand that through the same hole outside. And then you do multiple stitches and actually pretty easy, also not suturing inside the belly. And this is, a wiggling on the abdominal wall because 
it needs to be um, um, the knots need to be tied down, laid down out, out, outside. And it's a very easy closure. Six weeks post-op, it looks like this. Um, a lot of techniques, including the 50 most common procedures we have now, Oliver Minster and myself, uh, published in a uh, video atlas of pediatric endosurgery, we will hopefully release uh, next month. Um, and there are all these procedures in. I also want to invite you for the Central and Eastern course next year, also on pediatric MIS in Moscow, where also Juan de Augusti and Amulia Saxena will be part of the faculty. And for this year, Athens Congress, I invite you to take part in the masterclass, pediatric MIS, which will uh, be focused only, uh, deal only with complications and work, uh, worst case scenario in pediatric MIS. The last five slides um, are dealing with the question, who is training the next generation? You see, it's not so easy to do thoracoscopic repairs, especially suturing in the chest or in the abdomen and the next generation needs to be trained. So this is the first pill. The red pill is doing MIS. A lot of people want to do MIS and want to do neonatal MIS because they think it's fancy, but there is also the blue pill. And this blue pill needs to be taken at the same time. And what is the blue pill? Well, the blue pill is training. You see, there's this famous uh, piano player, Lang Lang. He, has, he is talented. And I think a lot of surgeons are talented, but he trains on his piano, rehearses seven to eight hours per day. So nowadays we have opportunities. The young generation of surgeons has opportunities that we didn't have. You can now take a box trainer and your iPad or iPhone, and you have to practice every day. So if you want to do neonatal minimal invasive surgery, you should tie knots in the box trainer every day. And then you go to the child and then you will be able to do it. So the blue pill comes with a red pill. If you take both pills, you will be fine. I thank you very, very much. Well, I think this is open uh, for uh, questions uh, that um, through uh, Professor Roll and myself we, uh, and Professor Sehata, uh, we could transfer to the speakers. Martin, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. And uh, as Juan just said, we have uh, several questions and remarks on, in the chat. And the first, I think you already mentioned it, but maybe Martin, you can briefly speak again about selection and uh, exclusion criteria for minimal invasive repair of, uh, of CDH. <clears throat> well, um, selection, I think type A and B defects are very good. If you do a C defect, you need to be able to sew in a patch and then the recurrence rate goes up as well. The future will tell whether the type C defect is a good idea. Type D defect, I would not do uh, thoracoscopically. Also most likely maybe the type D defect has severe pulmonary hypertension. And then it's a, it's a teamwork. It's a discussion with your neonatologist and with your anesthesiologist. And if they think it's not a good idea and the patient is not suitable or stable enough to undergo thoracoscopy, you should just proceed and do it open. Thank you. I think the next question is regarding, if I understand correctly, if there is a true hernia, what, what, what would you do with the hernia sac if you do it uh, minimal invasive? Yeah, I would actually leave the sac intact and sort of do a raffi because I don't like the connection of the thoracic uh, um, compartment and the abdominal compartment. However, um, like you would do it like a like plication and then go over it. Um, but we asked in that study where of the IPAC I, I mentioned, and then it was also like 50-50, half of the MIS surgeon would resect the sac and some would leave it. But... Um, yeah, it's two different approaches, which are both fine, I think. And another question, Martin, uh, 
It's a similar procedure if it's a right-sided CDH, I guess, yes. Yes, well, the right-sided CDH, uh, a lot of time is more severe. Um, so I would be very cautious to do it on the right side. To push the liver down can be a challenge. So if you wanna push the liver down, I would introduce a Ratex or a swab and then grab the swab with my grasper and then push with that swab on the liver to, to get it down. But basically it's the same procedure. And if it's a lateral defect um, where you can sort of put one stitch and get the liver down is fine, but it's a little more challenging and you always have to balance. If the patient gets uh, unstable and the CO2 maybe is a problem because the pulmonary hypertension is a problem, then you should also do it open. Do you like to continue, Juan? Well, I, I, I have recorded some questions from the audience and um, there is uh, one interesting is, uh, can you uh, identify the size of the defect before the operation in order to um, indicate uh, thoracoscopy? This is an excellent question. Uh, I think we cannot solve so far, although a lot of groups have tried. I have seen MRIs and CTs where people sort of um, try to image that defect and image the rest of the diaphragm, but that's not really feasible. We can do in the rat, in our lab, we can do a micro CT and do it, but, they, but the, the radiation exposure would be too big to do that in the neonate. So um, I don't think you can do it. However, there are indirect signs, like if the NG tube curls up in the chest, you know the stomach is in the chest. Whether the liver is up, you can see on an MRI or ultra ultrasound. So the indirect signs show you actually this is a larger defect. And uh, those with a larger defect usually have severe pulmonary hypertension. And so there are enough indirect signs, I think, to, to make a decision. However, as you say, it would be great to know the size uh, in advance. So we need additional markers. Um, this would be great if we had them, but at, at current, we don't have. Yeah, I agree with you, indirect markers, I most of them but no direct uh, way of, of, uh, of looking at it. Uh, there is another question about the position of the patient. Uh, Iftikar uh, asked, uh, why not to put the patient six hours before the operation in a lateral position? Um, probably I, I think that uh, the question is done to help to reduce the hernia content. Uh, that's what I interpret of the question. What do you think about? Well, I think it's an excellent idea. I've never tried it. Um, no. And I would be curious what, um, what the experience was with that. Juan, have you ever tried that? We are not doing this because I would be concerned that the healthy lung is com compressed and then maybe mucus is going in the contralateral bronchus and sort of um, make the healthy the healthy, it's not really healthy, but the better lung worse. But I have no experience with this. Yeah. Another question that is repeating is uh, the indication in the neonatal period, period and about to the approach by laparoscopy or thoracoscopy. Well, I would also, I would always go for the chest because um, I think it's much easier to push on the bowel than to pull on the bowel. Sometimes it's really trapped in especially smaller defects. And then if you pull in the bowel and you tear the serosa of a small bowel, that's really bad. And there's always, the, I think the ex exposure from the thorax once the bowel is in is perfect. There's plenty of space because of the pulmonary hypoplasia, the, the lung is never in the way. So I think exposure is better, visibility is better. Um, that's why, most surgeons, including me, would go from the chest. And if you find during the operation uh, that the defect is bigger than expected, what is your uh, decision? What well, I first have to decide, can I partly close the defect like I showed? I would, do, I would start medially with, with the first stitch, with the second and the third, and maybe patch only the lateral part. 
However, if I see like there's immediately almost no diaphragm, I would, I would not repair a type D defect, I would convert. Okay, great. Uh, Udo, do you want to ask anything or uh, something? Uh, Martin, I would like to say this is outstanding uh, presentation uh, full of tips and tricks for practical management of these problems. Regarding the sac in uh, posterolateral hernia, I consider it a good news because it makes it much easier to reduce the bowel. It reduces in just a few seconds. So I think it's better to keep it and you can placate it like if you have trouble with it, like you do in the eventration and then it's much easier than we break it and you have the problem of bowel coming up again. What do you think about that? Well, this is this was my answer and I'm, I'm great you, you uh, confirmed it. You can either placate it or take it or twist it. What you should not do is actually put a stapler across and resect it because those stapler lines can fall apart and then you have a, a defect. This is, has been described also, but I uh, uh, agree it, um, it is safer to keep it. And how about the Morgagni hernia? There's a long uh, debate about resecting the second Morgagni or not. What do you think about that? I usually do not res resect it. You, you, you saw in the video, um, that I, I, I left all those sort of bands there in the chest. I just close it. And I think even there is, I've never seen that, that, that um, sort of a uh, seroma develop between your suture line and the rest of the sac. Usually that re re resolves by itself. And if you had a ser seroma, it would be very easy to come back from the chest and sort of make a window in that. So yes. that's why as I a, leave it. As a compromise uh, between both opinions, I do plication. I just pull, pull the dome of the second Morgagni hernia and I take it to the suture. So I satisfy both groups. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I might try try that thank also. You, thank you. Yeah. Martin, there's, Udo, there's another question yeah. uh, which is of interest, I believe. Do you have any data if um, if an MIS repair of, of CDH reduces the onset of adhesive obstruction in, in obstructive bowel disease, which we see sometimes after open repair? Well, I think there was, I'm, I'm not really sure. I think it was, I would expect it would be less small bowel obstruction because you avoid the laparotomy I only know there is always the question, it's a mal-rotated bowel. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't do a LADS, is that harmful? And the data is, is just fine. Yeah. You don't have to do a LADS procedure, uh, which you can obviously from, we cannot do from, from the chest, that doesn't matter. But I would expect it's less adhesions, but I'm not aware really of a study showing the benefit. So the comp, but the four meter analysis showed the complication rate is not better. But it's not worse either. It's about the same, and I'm. I would be surprised if small bowel obstruction was not part of those complications they were assessed. And there is another another question. I don't know if you know this, Martin, but in our big center in Mannheim, it was for a time being they always performed very early at the same of the repair also a fundoplication, to because they they assumed that most of the children will have. A, Gerd, I wouldn't be happy with this anyway, but what is your uh, comment on this? Well, the Mannheim group published their data. It's from Konrad Reinshagen, this paper. And they, they did, as you say, early fund application versus late. And they found out the, re the reflux is better controlled if you do an early fund application at the same time of the repair. However, the outcome after two years in terms of reflux disease was the same. And yeah. that's why I would not recommend to do that. I agree. I agree. We have a, a lot of interaction and the good questions, but we cannot uh, carry on <laughs> them all because of the sake of time. Uh, again, if you look at the chat area, you see a great interest and a lot of comments and questions. I thank you again, Martin, for a great outstanding presentation. Thank you so much. And now we thank move you, on. Sandy. Yeah, thank you so much. And now back to uh, Juan to introduce uh, our next uh, distinguished speaker. 
Uh, thank you, Same. Um, <laughs> Professor Saxena uh, is uh, a very well-known uh, pediatric surgeon and researcher. He was moving along Europe in different centers. He, uh, so he uh, has a, a, a great expertise in many areas of uh, the uh, research in, in, in pediatric surgery, but also he is uh, uh, a very well um, and, and, and keen uh, surgeon. So he's going to um, talk about the laparoscopic approach to duodenal atresia that I think is a, a perfect operation for a neonatal laparoscopic surgery, probably is the best indication. And he's going to, to do a, a thorough uh, discussion about this topic. Thank you very much, Amulia, to, to be with us. Uh, thank you, Juan, for this introduction. Uh, thank you, Sami, for organizing this also together with you, sir. and to have wonderful panelists, uh, Dr. Rolle, as well as uh, uh, Dr. Lacher on this uh, program. So the topic which I've got is laparoscopic duodenal atresia. We are going to go through a lot of uh, tips and tricks as we uh, go through this topic, as well as what's the evidence uh, presently doing these procedures. Now, when we look at the progress in pediatric endoscopic surgery, initially the pediatric surgeons just put in the scope. We had scopes of 10 millimeters just to do diagnostics. The earlier operations were uh, some operations on ovarian cysts and appendicectomies. These were followed by reports in pediatric surgery on fund duplications, splenectomies, and colorectal procedures. The next that followed in pediatric surgery were congenital diaphragmatic hernias, have you, as you've heard a very nice talk right now, and hepatobiliary procedures were after that. The big breakthroughs in pediatric surgery came when esophageal atresia repairs were done thoracoscopically and the lung malformations. And surprisingly, the last thing that was reported in pediatric surgery in the area of laparoscopy was duodenal atresia repairs. Now, when you look at duodenal atresias, it's important to know what you're dealing with. Uh, the type one, as you can see, is just a membrane that causes intrinsic duodenal obstruction, whereas type two, you have an obliteration, which is attached by um, fibrous tissue, as well as then type three, in which there's a complete detachment. Be aware of one thing which you cannot see on this image is the area where the obstruction generally happens is the D2 area and the pancreas or the pancreatic tissue is just in the middle of the area that you're going to operate. When you look at the type one, it is important that there can be three different types. There can be a complete membrane, as you can see the A type, or you can have a fenestration as the B type. The reason I brought in this image is because of the C type, which is, has a windsock membrane or a windsock sign. And when you do a laparoscopic uh, repair, this is very important that you do not do the wrong type of repair in the windsock. What is also very important and which is not very clear, which you do not explore in these cases, is the duodenal atresia and the biliary duct anatomy. The uh, papilla of water can open in the proximal or even in distal part, and you do not explore this area too much, lest you might uh, damage something in that side. But it's very important once you open the proximal pouch or the distal segment that you see where bile is flowing out because that can have some consequences as we had in one of our patients. Now, what exactly is the repair? Am I reinventing the wheel? No, laparoscopically, uh, the Kimura operation is the one which I will show you and my preference also for these patients. Of course, there are trends emerging and there are multiple ways of approaching this uh, procedure and we will go through the different uh, trends that have come up in the repair of duodenal atresia. Now, what is very important uh, is the positioning of the patient as well as the entire team. What as you can see on the left-hand side, the surgeon is towards the bottom of the table with the camera holder. The patient is positioned towards the bottom of the table, absolutely towards the bottom with the head uh, also resting over here, the legs just towards the end, which is, makes it easier for the surgeon to stretch his arms and access the patient. 
The anesthetist is given complete control of the airways on the side, which is important. The scrub nurse stays away from the rest of the team because the team would like to have a good amount of access to the patient with the scrub nurse standing on either side. This is not my preference, rather stand behind me and just offer these instruments. What is very important is to keep one side, which you might have a tower, very clear uh, so that you can have all your tubing coming out from the tower directly to your patient. And if you're operating on a screen and do not have a static tower, it's very important to get your screen halfway through the table on top so you can see directly what you're operating. So positioning of the patient and uh, the way the team is placed around in the surgery is very important because this is a technically difficult surgery. And uh, I will show you the data why a lot of uh, discussion is about the difficulty of this. My preference is to place an uh, optic port on the left umbilical fold. Uh, this has been my practice over the years. I prefer a five millimeter scope and not a three millimeter. The cut is just two millimeters more, but the vision is absolutely fantastic with the five millimeter scopes. But I prefer three millimeter instruments, which over a period of time, I found that it's much easier to do suturing, especially when you have neonates. As you can see, I would like to triangulate my ports. So the right port is placed a little bit in the lower abdomen, the left one also in the lower abdomen. And I like to get a triangulation to my target area, which gives the best way for get, uh, approaching inside. If I place the right port a little bit lower on this, there will be a clash with the camera. And this is not what you want. So port placement is very, very important. And the next thing is that the ports have to be secured when you do this kind of surgery. I prefer a three port technique. That means I have one optic port and two work ports. There's nothing else that is introduced in the patient's body while doing this procedure. Now, port placement, I prefer in units only open port placement, a small incision, an article which has just appeared on how these safe port placements are done. You do not want to push in. Very important that the distance between the abdominal wall and the aorta is just two centimeters. You make a slip and you hit the, uh, one of the big vascular structures. Go inside uh, with a pointed scissors, stretch the uh, area, stretch the fascia, stretch the muscles, and place the port very clearly inside. Do not use any trocars uh, while placing these ports. The other thing is after placing these ports, you do not want displacement of these ports. What I prefer is to tie a steady strip. You can use any other tape. There are a lot of techniques described. And I take a suture, generally a four ovicrule or a three ovicrule, and I put a stitch on the skin so that every time with instrument exchanges that the ports are not falling out. Because ports falling out, you have deflation, of the insufflated CO2, which again increases the operating time and just causes frustration among the team operating if you're losing pressures constantly. One thing which is very important when you use the three millimeter ports, uh, uh, like I said, I do not uh, use the trocar. You can see the trocar in here. Make sure that the seal is also a three millimeter seal. Sometimes there are five millimeter seals which come and you have a constant gas leakage over there. Now, there are multiple ways of approaching duodenal atresia, and uh, I will go through the suturing technique. What are my instruments? I need an endoscopic needle holder, which is three millimeters. I need endoscopic scissors, three millimeters. I need a feeding tube, and we will come to this point of feeding tube, uh, why it's needed and what is the importance and uh, uh, to avoid pitfalls. I need sutures 5.0. I'm not going to tell you the type of uh, suture because I'm going to show you a meta-analysis on these sutures or U-clips if somebody wants this technique. We will also go through this later on. Then there is the stapler anastomosis. If you prefer to do a stapler anastomosis, you need a five millimeter stapler, uh, which uh, may or may not be available at the time. And it adds to the cost. It may decrease the time in doing the procedure, but then uh, you will have to uh, take the extra cost of acquiring this. Now, what is the advantage of the laparoscopic approach in duodenal atresia? The biggest advantage that I see because of the atresia, nothing has gone ahead of the duodenum. That means that your intestines are completely collapsed and not with air or fluid filled. That means you have a very good visibility to your operative field. The other thing which I feel is important is to detect a malrotation while you have your scope inside. And malrotation can be managed, or you could do the LADS procedures while you're doing the duodenal atresia repair. For me, these are the two biggest advantages as we uh, perform the surgery laparoscopically. Now, there are solutions to optimize an, uh, the exposure of the surgical field. And initially, in my first 
for your cases. I used to suspend the falciform ligament. I've stopped doing that. Now my practice is to suspend directly the proximal segment or the pouch of the duodenum, which gives me a very good uh, view while doing the procedure. So as you can see over here, you identify the proximal pouch of the duodenum very clearly. You can see the transverse colon on this side. A grasp it, of course, it's a retroperitoneal organ, so you will have to uh, clear it up so that you can get a nice grasp of the pouch. And once you have this pouch, I prefer to just bring it up, put a pass a hitch stitch directly to the abdomen, bring it up and directly uh, hitch it on the roof, which gives me a nice exposure. I do not have to balance it anyway to try to uh, get anything done on the proximal pouch. Now, this is the view you get laparoscopically. I think you get wonderful views. You have the proximal pouch, which you can see marked with the white arrows. You have a very nice view of the annular pancreas in this case, and you have the distal segment, which can be easily also identified, at least in this patient. Now, there are some procedural steps and technical consideration when you do it. Very important when you're doing these repairs, mobilize and approximate the distal segment before incising it. Do not incise the distal segment and then you find that you're not able to flap it on top of the pancreas for any reason. Use scissors to incise the proximal and distal segments. For me, it's absolutely no, no to go for electrocautery. It's the same principle when you do esophageal atresia repairs. You do not use a monopolar hook to, uh, to uh, open up the proximal pouch and you do not use the hook to detach the fistula after ligating. So same principle, just use the scissors and it's absolutely fine. I feel that if you use all the electrocautery, you might have a problem with the healing of the anastomosis and may result in some complications. The other very important thing when you do this procedure is to rule out distal webs or obstructions beyond the atretic area. Now, while I do these procedures, it is very important that I, first of all, when I know that this is a proximal pouch, this is the distal end, which I'm going to anastomose, the first stitch I put before even opening both the segments is a, is a stay stitch, and I approximate both these ends together just to make sure that there is no tension while I do the anastomosis on the top. What I'm using over here is a PDS50. Once that hitch stitch is there, the proximal and the distal uh, parts are open. As you can see, I only use a scissor. There is no electrocautery used. You can just incise it. This incision should be of a good size and I use the end of my instruments to determine the size of my anastomosis. I prefer to have it at least one centimeter uh, wide or one and a half centimeter wide. Once it is open, which is very important, that is the proximal pouch, the distal pouch, you will take the scissors and you will straight away make an incision and slide, uh, slice it open uh, at the anti-mesenteric side so that you have the good size uh, for the anastomosis. Now, what happens, and this is what you learn over a period of time, because these patients have an NG tube and you've opened the proximal pouch, you will have a drop in abdominal pressure because all the air which you have insufflated can go through that NG tube outside. So if you have an NG tube, which all these patients with duodenal atresia have, make sure that you have spigoted the NG tube before starting the procedure, or if the anesthetist is there, make sure that they spigot the NG tube so that you do not have a fall in pressure. We had opened the proximal pouch, everything just dropped, and we were not able to figure out because there were no leaks from the ports, but we found out that the, all the leaking was happening from the NG tube. So NG tube, very important. All the patients have it spigoted at that time. The other thing is very important is to pass the NG tube through the two, uh, two enterotomies that you've made to rule out a distal web. So this is also a very important part because you do not want to be stuck doing a nice laparoscopic case and then go back in two days because you've missed out a distal web. I'm talking of duodenal webs right now. I'll come to jejunal ileal atresias also in this talk. Now, sometimes you have this problem, and this is again a technical part, that the NG tube curls in the stomach. The proximal pouch is always very big. Your anesthesia is trying its best to push down the tube, but it curls back in the proximal pouch or it's going back into the stomach, it's not able to find its way to where you are. In this case, what I prefer is to pass a feeding tube via one of the ports, again, spigoted, so you don't lose all the air. And if you feel that you want to have both the ports for your instruments, I just make a small incision on the abdominal wall and pass the tube through that, while I just confirm that I do not have a distal atresia. 
Uh, all my sutures are passed and retrieved through the abdominal wall. There are, because I use three millimeter ports, I do not want any needles to be stuck in the port or coming in and out. I do not like to flatten the needles. I like them to have the nice curve. So there's one point in the abdominal wall, which I decide is the easiest for me to pull down my sutures, complete it, push it back up the abdominal wall and my assistant retrieves that. Now, just to give you an idea, this is the nasogastric tube identification. This is the proximal pouch, as you can see, nicely open. You can see the NG tube coming down over there. And once I have the NG tube out, I try to push it down through the distal part. As you can see over here, proximal part very nicely. Distal part, make sure that the NG tube is going nicely. Flip on the other side, just see that it comes through the DJ, that you're absolutely sure that you have missed, not missed a duodenal web. The problem is, and what you want to avoid, is getting into trouble with a windsock type of uh, 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 type one atresia. In a windsock, the problem might come in because you already have a windsock, and if you do the initial incision on the top and do the repair, uh, that is okay. But if you do an incision on the bottom beyond the windsock with the distal part, you will get into trouble because you've not taken care of the windsock membrane. So very important, this NG tube to pass it, see it, that it goes through. Otherwise, you know, you've opened at the wrong place and then you have to probably go up to do the second incision, close this up and do the repair on the top. So, the first two stitches are placed and the bottom, once the two stitches are placed, this is the proximal and distal part. And then we start doing the anastomosis. My preference is for interrupted sutures, but we will go through interrupted versus running sutures, uh, how they can be done. My preference, and I find the ease in doing interrupted sutures in these cases. This is how first the back wall is done and the front wall, the repair is also done at the same time. You can see all the suturing on the front and then it's all uh, closed at the time. Like I said here, PDS50 interrupted. Now you can have duodenal atresias with malformations and these are in patients generally who have Down syndrome, what you can see very nicely, the proximal bulbar part of the uh, duodenum, uh, which you can see here, the appendix, which is just lying next to the um, gallbladder and you can see the complete malrotation on the side over here. I personally feel malrotations are easier to operate. And the reason for ease is that you just do the LADS procedure, both the segments are sitting in front of each other. The anastomosis is so beautiful that you just bring them on top of each other. And I find that these cases uh, laparoscopically are so gratifying. So as easily you can see, I've done the LADS over there, very easily brought the distal segment. They're just kissing on top of each other. If you can see very clearly, I have the pancreas over here and I did a beautiful anastomosis on top of it. Uh, at the same time, I can do the appendicectomy, bring it, bringing it out through the uh, uh, optic port or the umbilical port and uh, push it back in. I do a cecopexy whenever I do a LADS, but that is my preference. So I can keep the non-rotation that is the small bowel on the right hand side and the large bowel on the left. Now is duodenal jejunostomy an option? And I had a problem because I could not approximate the distal segment with the proximal pouch. So in this patient, I just went and I did a duodenal jejunostomy, but my search also gave another thing that the first successful repair of duodenal atresia was reported in France more than a hundred years ago. And Vidal at that time did a gastro jejunostomy. So he just even left the duodenum alone, which probably in those years was a smart thing to do, lest that you damage uh, some uh, pancreatic tissue or the papilla of water. The first successful duodenal jejunostomy was performed in Denmark in 1914. And luckily this surgeon reported 61 years later on about this patient who was found to be in very good health. So that means that this is an option which can be taken and it has worked in hands of people who have even done the surgery over a hundred years ago. It's only in 1977 that Ken Kimura came out with a double diamond anastomosis, which was advocated and we pediatric surgeons picked it up in open surgery and then later on brought this out to our laparoscopic approach. Now I'd like to share some important insights. And this was a systematic review and meta-analysis that we did in 2017. At that time, we wanted to look a lot of things which uh, uh, recent uh, systematic reviews have been missing as well as the meta-analysis have been missing. What we found by 2017, we had around 218 patients reported by that time. 
open repairs were in 94 and laparoscopic repairs were in 124, which is almost comparable sizes. Now, what was important is we looked into the data that uh, the sample sizes were same, similar in birth weight, age, and comorbidities. That means the number of Down syndromes were distributed between the both sides, uh, cardiac anomalies and malrotations. Interesting, when we first compared laparoscopic repairs to open repairs, that we found out that the overall complications were same, whether you did it laparoscopically or whether you did it with open repairs. The stricture formations were also the same, laparoscopic versus open. So overall, we found that there were no significant dis uh, differences between the two groups, open and laparoscopic repairs. What was more interesting is we found out that, like other groups have found out in the recent times, that uh, the laparoscopic repair, there was less time to establish full feeds. There was less time to discharge the uh, patients from the hospital. That means shorter hospital stays. But all those repairs, which were reported till 2017, uh, showed a longer operative time with the laparoscopic approach. So that was the disadvantage in doing the surgery laparoscopically. Now, out of interest, there were some things which were more important for me than to just see what was the reason for um, uh, having the laparoscopic advantages, what suture materials were used by the different groups. So when we saw the silk was used, PDS was used, as well as Vicryl was used, there was no uh, significant difference. And um, when you see in the overall complications, when any of these sutures were used, I come back to the point, my preference is for interrupted sutures, but if you use running sutures, there were no uh, significant increase in complications either way. And even ports, people have used four and five millimeter ports versus two to three millimeter ports, and there were no overall changes in complications. So it's irrespective of your suture material type of suturing, as well as the port size, that uh, you will not uh, have these complications. So the conversions to lapros uh, uh, during laparoscopic repairs, that means I wanted to check what are the reasons for conversion from laparoscopic to open? We found out that the differences in suture materials, again, suturing techniques, as well as the port size were not responsible for the uh, conversion from laparoscopic to open. Now we looked at those complications and conversions at that time. I was looking at it, uh, poor visualization probably could have been because of whatever reasons. Uh, uh, that the surgeons could not go in, but I could not understand the converse, uh, the conversion for a concomitant TOF to be done at the same time. Distal atresia, th uh, thermal injury, one thing which I said, I do not use any diathermy at all, and malrotation, which I feel it's easier to do it this way, but this may be a case with malrotation volvulus, then sometimes it's difficult to even visualize anything. Now, when you look at the complications, there were 20 complications, and I separated these complications between those related directly to the surgery and those uh, not related to this. So there were five anastomotic strictures, and that's why it's very important that you have a good size anastomosis of one to one and a half centimeter. You had five anastomotic leaks, which has been an issue for a long time, and that's why uh, duodenal atresia repairs did not pick up. Missed malrotation, uh, this should have been looked at. I'm, it's very difficult to miss this now because now people are aware of it. And there was one missed, missed duodenal web and I've given you what is the best way to approach this uh, duodenal web using one of these spigoted NG tubes. So as we summarize the uh, meta-analysis and the systematic review, so complications and uh, conversion rates in laparoscopic repair were unrelated to port size, suture material or the suturing uh, technique. And the only advantages we found in laparoscopic repair was early uh, establishment of full feeds, early discharge, but as I mentioned before, significantly longer time than open repairs. We have to go through what is going on in the world of duodenal atresia repairs. So the first case was reported by the group in Utrecht, and that was the laparoscopic duodenal du duodenostomy for duodenal atresia. This was done in 2001. And uh, Bax, Ure, Van der See, as well as Tuil, they reported this first case in a trisomy 21 patient. The next report was in 2002, and this was a small series reported by Steve Rothenberg. It was a case series of three atresias and one web, and exactly the same report with the laparoscopic duodenal duodenostomy for uh, duodenal obstruction in children. Then there was a big pause. You saw people stop reporting in, on duodenal atresia. 
And one thing this report shows, which came out in 2007, this was one of the reports from uh, Holcomb's group, that this was a technical innovation more. They use these nitinol U-clips for doing the anastomosis. So it was very clear that there was positive of data from 2001 to 2007. People found it as a difficult suturing method. And that's why even innovative things like nitinol clips, which were used for cardiac surgery and cardiac operations, were being then offered for uh, duodenal atresia repair. The only thing is that I found only this single report using the uh, U-clips. I've not found any other report uh, to date after this 2000 report on using this clip for duodenal atresia repairs. The first robotic case was reported in 2007. This was on a 2.4 kilo baby, one day old newborn. Uh, John Meehan reported this thing, it took less than three hours, according to him, uh, to do this case. And he had the patient at an unremarkable post-operative course. Uh, I just feel that the robotic instruments are just too big and laparoscopically as we have improved uh, these cases uh, laparoscopically is still been my pre preference unless something uh, more miniaturization in uh, robotics takes place. One thing which was very important, and I mentioned, we looked for distal duodenal webs. The question came over here in a 2010 review that should we be concerned about jejunoileal atresias during the repair of duodenal atresias? And this paper was very important. It very clearly said a second atresia should not be a concern during laparoscopic repair of duodenal atresia. So do not look for a jejunal ileal atresia because the incidence is very, very low. So do not try to go on and take more and more time trying to walk the bowel while you look into that. So with this at a very low chance, my uh, um, approach is also not to look further down into any uh, jejunal ileal atresias. And generally, as you see in the cases which I've shown also, that most of the time the colon is quite full when you go inside, so you know that it is no, not a tretic, it has gone through. Now, this is for me a very important paper that came out in 2011 and was a series and it was uh, by Van der Say, who wrote some very important things about duodenal atresia repairs. The first important conclusion was that this is one of the most demanding pediatric laparoscopic surgical procedures. And he said, which is also what I noted between 2001 till now, there was a relative radio silence followed apparently caused by unsatisfactory results. So there must be a lot of people who must have tried duodenal atresia repairs after the initial report that came from Utrecht, but the results were not that great. And then all of a sudden you saw lack of reporting until you know, things were improved and techniques were improved or more suturing skills were improved while trying to do these procedures. A very huge series, I must mention, 112 cases were compared. Uh, this is again, 2017. Now we're coming towards uh, our times right now. Uh, laparoscopic versus open, they compared 44 open versus a large series of uh, 68 laparoscopic repairs. And the main conclusions are what I mentioned previously also in the meta-analysis and the systematic review that feeds, hospital stays, and morbidity are almost the same. So, or much improved in these laparoscopic cases when you compare to the open at that same time. Now, something that has come up also more new, that is 2017, is now the thought process of instead of doing a Kimura, a double diamond anastomosis, which I was taught as a trainee and later on also used in laparoscopy, is that to do a laparoscopic duodeno duodenostomy with parallel anastomosis. I thought the parallel anastomosis has more chance of closing, uh, but this group says that the risk of leakage or stenosis does not seem to be significant or significantly uh, different than what you do with the Kimura. So new thought process also, they presented 22 patients in which they have found uh, very good results. I do not have the experience with this side-to-side -side anastomosis, but I'm aware that this technique also exists. The next is the duodenal atresia using, using a miniature stapler. Um, this is uh, uh, published also with the two groups and Martin Lacher is one of the authors on this group using a stapler for doing the duodenal atresia repairs. Of course, the uh, uh, report over here is that it uses significantly shorter operating times than hands-on sutures, which is correct. But I've also experienced uh, complications with the stapler itself, not with the technique, with the stapler itself, plus the cost in getting the stapler may be easier for a lot of centers to just do the open hand repair. But 
definitely shorter operating times if you use one of these mini staplers. So I'd like to conclude my talk towards what we have all seen that duodenal atresia has variations and you have to keep them in mind and they can be often associated with malrotations. Incise both ends of the atresia with scissors and avoid electrocautery. For me, electrocautery is absolutely a no-go in duodenal atresias. A distal web should be ruled out using an NG tube progression. And like I said, if it curls up in the stomach, try to get it through a separate incision, but progress it, see that it comes out from the DJ, you're on the safe side. If approximating segments is difficult, perform a duodenal jejunostomy. I have no hesitation in not opening the distal segment of the duodenum, just bring a part of the jejunum and just uh, do an anastomosis, which is almost tension free. Technical variations in performing anastomosis are constantly emerging. So there are other reports than what I've been doing. Uh, the Kimura technique, there have been reports using mini staplers as well as side to side anastomosis. And we look forward to further technical variations also emerging in this field. The advantages of laparoscopic repair are early uh, start of feeds, achieving full feeds and shorter hospital stay. These have been all the advantages in most of the systematic reviews and meta-analysis. The last thing is that laparoscopic approach, if you're doing it with a hands-on technique, it requires a very good level of suturing. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Amulia. Thank you very much. I think it was really a comprehensive review of uh, laparoscopic approach to duodenal atresia. Uh, there have been uh, three um, questions. Uh, one was about complications, but I think you explained very thoroughly uh, the complications. Uh, but I would like to know uh, if, if you have any special advice to avoid complications. Well, there are two or three different uh, things. First of all, I think uh, missing out a web is something which can create a complication. That is very important. Um, suturing is something which you have to know from before. You cannot uh, learn suturing on this patient. It has to be absolutely uh, you know, proper. And what my approach is, I do not take full, uh, 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 what do you call it? Um, I do not take mucosal bites. I try to take as much as serosal bites and close with serosa so that the mucosa folds inside. I do not know if it is evidence-based, but at least that's my approach. Pick the serosa and the serosa from other side. So while you tie, it ties down uh, at that time. The, the problems in suturing, uh, which uh, I feel, of course, if you use a vicral suture, uh, you can use it multiple times, but once the vicral suture is inside, it sticks to the bowel. It's very difficult sometimes to pinch it out again and again, versus a PDS suture, which is more shape memory, it stands up on the side, it's easier to pick it up. So although in traditional surgery, I always use vicral, but in laparoscopy, I've changed to, just because of the shape memory of uh, PDS to using PDS in that case at that time. Uh, so these are some things, uh, and of course, you'll have to do a number of cases. If you remember very carefully, there was a paper from Glasgow from Robert Karaki that, you know, children, and I'm talking of open surgery, who have very low birth weight, are probably always a risk factor in these repairs. So you have to choose your patients carefully. For us, the cutoff is maximum 1.75. Under 1.75, would we do not try. I mean, of course you can attempt it, but uh, I respect that papers that, you know, it should not be done. And most important thing is if you have a Down child and your anesthesia is not happy to proceed laparoscopically, do not do that. Because anesthesia has to be involved from the very beginning. They should know your skills. And if the anesthesia says, look, I know how good you are, but this child is just not the right one because of the cardiac problem. So that is where I would like to stay away from them. Thank you. Uh, another yeah. question was about full feeding. Um, when you start to, to, um, to feed your patients, um, and in, in case you leave a tube, uh, are you starting feeding uh, immediately? So I do not leave a transanastomotic tube. So I do not leave any tubes across, it's just free. Uh, my opinion is that the moment you finish this anastomosis, there is going to be gastric juices and bile pouring all over it. You cannot stop it. So my opinion is to start feeds as early as possible. So what happens is, it, I do not decide that. The moment the NG aspirates are low, start feeding. 
So this can happen as soon as 24 to 48 hours. Sometimes you know that the proximal part of the uh, duodenum is so dilated that it's very difficult for feeds to go through. A lot of it stagnates on the top. So start as early as you can. And if you are going to have an anastomotic leak, you will know it within the first 24 to 48 hours. So I'm not worried. The leak is not going to be because you started feeding. The leak is because of the amount of huge amount of gastric juices already pouring onto that anastomosis by that time. May I, may I ask you something, Amulya? Because this is always um, shown in the retrospective an analysis and also in the reviews and, and meta analysis that feeding starts earlier in, in, in laparoscopic repair. But is there a true randomized study which has been performed uh, and to really compare? Because as you just said, it's not up to the method of, of surgery, it's up to the amount of gastric remnants and to the overall um, uh, child's behavior when you start, you can also start after open repair on the first day if the aspirates are, are, are less. Well, I, Udo, I left it to uh, the aspirates and the child, you know, behaving after the surgery. That is also very important. You do not have to force something at that time. And also the age of the child. I mean, I'm sure there must be a lot of people who must have done surgeries even when they are 1.5 or 1.2, I, who may have never reported this. But the chances of, you know, the repair of the wound and the child going through that entire surgery is something which is also has to be taken into consideration. The prolonged period of operative time, you know, whatever you're doing, if you're doing a child small, it's not going to be, I mean, nobody can tell me I finish it off in half an hour. You're going to keep a pneumoperitoneum for at least two and a half to three hours in such a small child and have technical uh, difficulties plus swearing two or three times at least because something fell off or something did not go in right. So these technical difficulties, Everything is possible. You can keep going smaller and smaller. And, you know, we are trying to do our best. But the chances of doing uh, or getting into some kind of complication is higher. And that's why I'd rather restrict myself to a number like 1.75 to 1.8. And that's that's good enough. You're free to do whatever you want. But, you know, like I said, you know, it, the abdomen is much more smaller. The anesthesia is struggling also with the child. They would rather have the child repaired quicker. There is another question about the number of stitches do you do usually do in, in these patients uh, in the anastomosis, number of stitches. It's difficult, I think, to, to, to give a, um, a number. Uh, you, Juan, you're absolutely right. I cannot give a number. It's just your gut feeling that the next stitch has to sit a little bit away from that. Uh, it's even millimeters uh, away from each other, but on the screen, it looks like two miles away from each other. So it's just... Absolutely right. Too many stitches, you're bound to found fibrosis and you're going to get into some kind of trouble. So I'm, I won't be able to give an answer to that. I just ha have a good feeling like two, three millimeters is a good place to put in over there. Yeah. But like I said, the incision has to be one to one and a half centimeters on both the sides that you do not want a stenosis of the anastomosis. Um, regarding to duodenal membrane, I found very difficult to uh, identify the place to do the, the to open in the duodenum. Uh, I remember to put an endoscope in in one patient and try to uh, to, to find the, the the place to open the duodenum. At the end, I, I decided to do the uh, opening in the place uh, that has to be, like you show us today. Uh, I think uh, the uh, second part of the duodenum is the, the perfect choice to open it. Um, what is your opinion about that? I'm sorry, Juan, can you rephrase the question to second yes. part of the duodenum? Uh, the place to open in the duodenum when uh, duodenal atresia is, uh, is, is duodenal membrane. Uh, in case of duodenal membrane, which is the, the place to open in uh, because is very challenging. You're, you're talking about a windsock type of one or, uh, or a distal web? That's, that's a difference. It's a distal web. In the distal web, you will not know the distal web unless you've not made an incision uh, in that. Uh, the thing is only if you have a complete type of atresia, you might be lucky that there might be too much fluid filled into that distal web, but webs have opening. So whatever goes, it goes through across. So in this case, you pass the tube 
And I'm not going to do a laparoscopic uh, web resection. In this case, the best thing would be to close up this area and then open the upper pouch and do a, a duodenal jejunostomy in this case. Just close this up, whatever you've opened, you push the tube, pull back your tube, do a repair over there and just uh, go for a, a duodenal jejunostomy. Great. Samen, please. Yes. Yeah, there is a lot of uh, questions actually and a lot of interaction from the uh, audience. What I like is that it's a combination of tips and tricks together with a strong scientific evidence. So it's truly really very informative and uh, useful for practice. Uh, I'll try to summarize some of the questions here. Do you leave a drain, Amolia, or not? I don't leave any drains. Good. And uh, how about the 6-O vicral uh, sutures, RB2 needle? Uh, do you have experienced this from Eftekharjan? Uh, passed through three millimeter scope with good tissue penetration. Do you have experience on that? Well, I've just, uh, like I said, I used the five zero, bring it yeah. from uh, the abdominal wall, six zero, and going into ports and losing anything in the ports or straightening needles, I, I, that's not my uh, preferred approach. Perfect. Uh, for a membrane, uh, would you like to resect only the membrane or just leave it and do a dedenial dedenostomy? Uh, no, for membranes, I do a duodenal yeah. jejunostomy. I just bypass it. I do not like to touch a. Uh, the, uh, there's a difference again, like I told Juan. Is it a membrane, a windsock, or a distal web? Yeah. If you have a windsock, then you have to be very careful that you see your NG tube coming through. If your NG tube is curling again and again, and it's not coming through at all, then you have a windsock. If you do a duodenal duodenostomy at that time, you'll be in trouble. Perfect. Uh, I think this brings us to the end of uh, our session. Uh, if there is no uh, more comments or questions, uh, there are a few questions we can't answer for the sake of time because we just finished exactly on time. I would like again to thank our two distinguished speakers for enriching us with two very interesting discussions, not only from the scientific point of view, but uh, again from the art of presentation. Actually, they are very attractive and very informative. We had two uh, very eminent moderators who made this really an interactive and very beneficial uh, session, uh, Udo Rolle and Juan de Agustin. I would like to thank again uh, Martin Lachar, Amolia Saxena. And this is actually a very good uh, representation of the collaboration, ongoing collaboration between UFSA and WUFAFS. This is how uh, the big five organizations in the world in pediatric surgery are collaborating together for the welfare of children. And I think this way we grow together uh, stronger. We have very interesting and uh, very active discussion going on on the chat area. I'm sure that whoever who did not uh, join this, we have 400 registration, would like to review and see it again, I myself, would like to see it again, and I'm sure a lot of the audience, even who attended today, would like to see it. We'll keep it uh, available uh, for uh, WUFAPS members, uh, which you can join by joining our website, uh, www.wufafs.org, and you become a member. Even if you are a UFSA member, you can again become a WUFAPS member. We'll do the same for UFSA. And uh, again, this would like to thank the Alexandria Medical Training Center for sponsoring this activity. Please stay tuned for our upcoming activities. And thank you again and stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.